I was giving a speech at an auditorium and it wasn't as full as it could be. Per year. So our next auditions will be in October and those students who are accepted into the program in the ensuing weeks would then begin singing in the National Children's Chorus. I will break a shampoo bottle if I tried to sing. Like it just does not work for me. I have zero training. And anytime I sing, everybody's like, mom, stop. This is normal. There's going to be a time where you're not gonna have that many notes. You're gonna try things and it's gonna sound awful, but it's okay and you will get through this. Today, friends, I have Luke McAndifer with us on the podcast as a guest. We get to talk about all things Grammy award-winning National Children's Chorus. He's been with them for 20 years. Luke started his career with piano when he was six years old, took lessons, and then was going to college to be a lawyer, pivoted from being a lawyer into music, and here's where he is. And the work that he's doing with children is unbelievable. So if this is your vibe, this is your episode. Listen in and enjoy. Hey, friends, on the podcast today, we have a special guest named Luke McKendifer. Luke, thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much, Jen. Yeah, I'm excited to have you. All things music and singing and all this good, happy stuff. So you started playing the piano, right? Was that your first instrument? Yes, I started playing piano when I was six years old, and that was my introduction to music. So my parents had asked me what I wanted for Christmas, and I made this very long list of toys. And they told me that a few days before Christmas, I crossed out everything and just put piano at the top. So they were very moved by that, and they got me my very first spinet piano, a very small one, a very modest piano. But I started playing by ear and then started taking piano lessons, and that started my love for music. Wow. Did you ever go in? I mean, obviously you're singing, I'm guessing if you're leading a choir like you do, did you play other instruments as well? Uh, Yes, just a little bit, but piano was my main instrument. Okay. And do you still play to this day? I do. Generally speaking, I'm conducting. So there is a pianist in the room, but I do play for uh, for my own purposes. So generally speaking, I do play piano for uh, for Uh, recreation and as well as uh, studying scores at home. And I can accompany rehearsal and play when I need to, but generally speaking now I'm conducting and there is a pianist in the room. Okay. And so when you're conducting, because I'm a newbie to music and people listening on this channel are going to be a little bit newer to music and you have a choir, do you have different, I mean, I know when I think of somebody conducting an orchestra, there's different instruments that do different things. How does it work with a choir? Well, voices are just a different instrument, and I would compare voices most closely with the string section of an orchestra. And so you have in a mixed chorus, sopranos, altos, tenors, and basses. And in a children's chorus, you have different uh, levels of of treble singing. So we have soprano one, soprano two, and and lower voices as well. Okay, interesting. And do kids, I know that you are an award, a Grammy award winning, even not just award winning, a Grammy award winning National Children's Chorus is what you lead. Um, do kids' voices change? Because I'm looking at my kids and is there like a sweet spot where there's an age and all of a sudden their voices start to do something different? Well, when children are very young, they're all singing with their voices that in the same range. And we really try to help them develop their head tone, which is singing uh, in the upper part of their voice and learning how to use that throughout the range and building strength. For girls, as they mature, they continue strengthening their treble voice. And of course, for boys, their voices drop an octave uh, around the age of 13 to 15. Okay. So is that hard for them when they're in that dropping stage or can you sing through that? It really is challenging because they go from being an extremely proficient treble singer to completely losing control of their instrument. And it can be quite discouraging, which which is why it's really important psychologically to guide them through the process to let them know this is normal. There's going to be a time where you're not going to have that many notes. You're going to try things and it's going to sound awful, but it's okay and you will get through this. And so it's important that they feel well supported through that transition. Okay. And I guess I've always viewed singing as a talent. Is it a skill? Like, can anybody develop the ability to sing? I think that anyone has the ability to improve their voice. Obviously, 
uh, skill in addition to your genetics in terms of what instrument you're born with do play a lot into what is the instrument that you have to work with. Uh, I will say that everyone, though, is capable of improving the way that they sing and making the best out of their voice. I get it. When singers sing on stage at concerts, they have the things in their ears, right? So that they can hear how they're sounding or how do they stay on. It's so interesting to me how you could stay on tune and stay on all those notes when there's so much going on and getting feedback to be like, okay, I'm good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for modern performances, sometimes singers have like a, a monitor in their ear so that they can hear all of the instrumentation that's going on. Uh, in classical music, there are no microphones and people just use the acoustics of the room to listen and to hear where the pitch is in addition to feeling where it is in in the voice as well yeah okay so i have a question about that since your sound and music i was giving a speech at an auditorium and it wasn't as full as it could be so then you had this weird echoing going on and they said you know if this auditorium was full you wouldn't have that but because it's not full, you have that outgoing. And it was so hard to stay in focus of what I was doing because it would do that reverb. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's normal. Yeah, so the reflective surfaces in a room are going to make the sound reflect more and make it more present and increase the reverb. And when you have people filling a hall, the clothes of people and lots of bodies in the room will absorb and dampen the sound. So, of course, it makes a room much more boomy and echoey if there are fewer people. I think that's more distracting, though, for speaking than for singing. So when you're singing, if there's a bit of an echo, it doesn't confuse what you're singing in the present moment. Whereas if you're speaking and you're hearing your words come back to you, like if there's an echo on the phone call, I mean, at least for myself, I can't continue. We have to, <laughs> we're, you know, so but I don't think that's, that's an issue for singers uh, as much in terms of that confusion that you would experience as a speaker. Okay. Okay. I just was like, I was thinking about my own experience. I'm like, this is insanity. And then I was thinking about interviewing you. And when you have these kids singing, like how they can mentally keep that in track, but that's nice to know that they don't have that same problem lucky little bugs. Yes. And, and also a lot of the spaces that we perform in are acoustically created to have audiences in them and to have just the right amount of reverb. So Carnegie Hall, for instance, will not have a, a, a huge boomy echoey sound at any point, never mind if there are uh, 3000 people in the audience or if there are 500 people. Yes, there will be a difference, but it will not swing from one end to the other. Oh, wow the technology of the design of these places, huh? That's why Carnegie Hall is so special. Absolutely, yes. Yes. Okay, so you are um, part of the National Children's Chorus and you, like from what I see on the notes, like it's grown 25% since 2020? Well, the organization has grown much more than that. But yeah, I mean, o over time, but, uh, but in, in 20. In the year 2020, we did grow about 25%, which is pretty significant considering that uh, you couldn't sing in a room together in that year. And we had to pivot everything online. But our team really came up with a, a truly engaging educational curriculum that was so popular that our enrollment grew about 25% in that year. And that was just uh, really exciting because we were able to keep music alive in the hearts and minds of students as they were experiencing a great deal of isolation and, um, you know, emotional turmoil at that time. So we were very happy with that. Oh, no, I believe it. Um, and now you are in how many cities did you say? Because I have Los Angeles, New York, Washington, DC, San Francisco, Austin, Dallas, and Boston. Yes, and then you can add Chicago to that to make eight. So the National Children's Chorus is in eight chapter cities. And we also offer online access for students who are wanting to join who live outside of chapter cities for a limited number of enrollment for those. Those students then are able to join us for our actual performances at Carnegie Hall, Walt Disney Concert Hall in LA, as well as internationally. Wow, and how many students would make up a particular chorus? Well, in each city, we have the uh, structure of seven different levels. Obviously, when a, st a city is just beginning, we can't 
open all seven straight away. So it builds maybe from two or three, but there are seven levels, four in the junior division and then three in the senior division. So it just depends on the level in terms of how many per group. So the highest levels generally have uh, between 50 and 90 and then the youngest levels uh, starting at ages five years old, it's about 20 in the room. You can imagine uh, 35 year olds might be a little hard. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, oh my gosh, I'd cry. Okay, so they start at, yeah, I was going to ask, like the junior ages is age five to what? It's about ages five to 11, and then 10, yeah, and about 10 to 17, depending on skill level, students will be promoted into the senior division, and that's the group that travels internationally, the one that just did our uh, recorded at Abbey Road Studios in London, and also participates in our annual um, opera academy. Wow fascinating to me and now do you normally see families drawn to it because it's a it's a hereditary thing at some level like you said i think it's not necessarily we don't necessarily get um children of musicians or children of singers i mean we do we do have those but i would have to say it's just normal families where their children express an interest in music and then we work in cooperation with the parents to bring out the best in the students and to educate them also finding out what their goals are educationally, what they want to pursue in college. So we help steer them in the right direction and give them the tools and resources that they need in order to progress. Okay. And what would be, I mean, I, I'm thinking of a rock star typically as a, like someone that uses their voice for talent in the future, obviously a teacher of such source, but what other career paths do people have, or is it and a social outlet a lot of times for them to continue. There are so many reasons to participate. Uh, we know that most of our students are not going to go on and be a singing star. Some will. Several of our students uh, go to all of the best schools in our country and around the world, including Juilliard, Curtis, Royal Academy of uh, uh, Music in, in a Royal Conservatory in London. Uh, however, we see music as much bigger than that. Students learn a lot of life skills through their participation in the program, and that enables them to pursue whatever their goals are in college and in university studies with music still being an important part of their lives. That is something they greatly love, enjoy, and can support. And there are so many careers in the music field other than singing itself. There are music administrators, uh, people who need to run these organizations, as well as a uh, production team, marketing. Uh, it really helps to have that background in music in order to support the industry as a whole. Mm -hmm. No, it sounds like it. And how did you get on this path? Like, how did you end here? Well, I was planning to be a lawyer. I was at UCLA getting my English degree, finishing that up and preparing for the LSAT. And then I was also a pianist and asked to conduct as a church music director in my early 20s. And I had never conducted before, so I took some conducting lessons and then I ended up having to do a concert. So that videotape was then shared with the dean of the school at UCLA School of Music. And then I was invited to pursue a master's degree in conducting. So that was a big signal to me that I need to move in a different direction. Uh, from law and which is interesting because i still need to be pretty knowledgeable <laughs> yeah no i'd imagine right like contracts and all that thing yeah Ab absolutely but uh but i'm really happy that music is what i get to do and everything related to music on a daily basis and you spend most of your time with the children's chorus but you did some other stuff with adults too right core is there a choral or something sorry <laughs> Yes, I, I, I work with uh, many different groups, but of course, the National Children's Chorus and our organization has uh, been uh, the pr my primary focus for many years. Actually, next or this coming year makes my, my 20th anniversary with the company. So, <laughs> Wow. Yes. Amazing. Okay. So when somebody is interested in trying out, have they had music lessons typically before with somebody local? And then that person's like, you know what? You have some natural talent. This is something you should look at. And it gets elevated to you. Or how does the path go for a student that's interested? Uh, 
Some of our students have received training in the past. Others have never been in a chorus before and just have felt that they want to learn how to sing. At the auditions, all of our instructors are, are trained to look into the future, so to speak. We have to look for the potential. It's very rare that you're going to get an eight or a nine-year-old who can sing with a huge amount of skill like that. That's not normal. Uh, no matter how well they're trained, they're still too young. So we have to listen for the potential at the audition. And then we place the student in our program based on where we feel uh, they would fit best. Uh, obviously, if students are not um, are, are not able to match pitch and if they're not able to do basic things, we then suggest to them that they do work on those skills and come back and audition again. Okay. And you're running auditions all the time, right? They're open, ongoing for somebody that's interested in applying. Yeah, you can sign up uh, throughout the year, but the auditions happen three times per year. So our next auditions will be in October. And those students who are accepted into the program in the ensuing weeks would then begin singing in the National Children's Chorus in the month of January. Okay. I'm guessing with the branches everywhere. So if Los Angeles is running a full born program and Dallas is running a full born program, do you ever pick from those programs then and then even have a higher of all the best out of each place? Or is it really how the group sings together, not necessarily how each person does individually? Well, the students are trained in the exact same way in every city, meaning that it, they sing the exact same music in in the same manner. So even though different conductors are training them, the breath marks are happening in the same exact measures. The dynamics are the same, uh, the crescendos, the decrescendos. So all of the articulation as well as the expression of the music has been predetermined. Therefore, we do like to create collaborative events, like when we perform at Carnegie Hall in New York that draws students from all over the country. We do not have students uh, apply to in terms of, uh, you know, a attending Carnegie Hall, they don't have to be selected from Los Angeles, it's those who want to participate, uh, basically, uh, with the knowledge that everyone has been trained, and is a member of our top level ensemble. So we, we don't take it farther than that. If there are solos, then students get to audition for those and those uh, students would be matched with the solo that they would uh, perform best in. But for our collaborative events, we invite the students in those levels from across the country. Okay. And you just uh, said something that triggered my brain. Um, when they learn to take a breath. So when you're learning, how, because I will break a shampoo bottle if I tried to sing, like it just does not work for me. I have zero training. And anytime I sing, everybody's like, mom, stop. Like, just don't. I'm like, okay, fine. Whatever. I'm having fun. It's about having fun. But so are you taught when to breathe and how to do the whole note and all those different pieces? Yes. So we will place the breath in places that make sense for the students. You know, you should never be running out of air. So we do teach a great breathing, but at different ages, there will be only so much air that a student will have. As they get older, they'll be able to get through longer phrases. And so we make sure that the breaths are sensibly placed in the music. So it's important to breathe every time that it's marked so that you have enough air for the next phrase. Oh, I like this. Now, what happens if somebody, well, I guess you don't have anybody in Denver, but I'm like, what happens if you have somebody at altitude? They just have to breathe more frequently, right? It's funny you should say that because our opera camp has been in Vail, Colorado the last three years, and I was definitely feeling the altitude this past year, a little bit hard to breathe. But you're right, the altitude really does affect uh, singing, and I think particularly when singers perform in Colorado, they really have to take that under consideration. Uh, not just classical singers, I, I think I just read Taylor Swift recently on her tour, I had to have oxygen tanks for her performances in Denver at the sides of the stage. Uh, because breathing is such an issue in Colorado or at higher altitudes anywhere in the world. Yeah, no, I live in Park City, Utah. That's my problem, friends. It's not that I'm a bad singer. It's that I'm at 7,000 feet above seawater. It's affecting my singing abilities. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so um, talk us, to us a little bit about Project Unison. So Project Unison is a, a new level of scholarship at the National Children's Chorus. We already fund every single family that qualifies for our uh, scholarship program. So depending on uh, financial need, students are subsidized by our scholarship fund. But Project Unison is a new level where we collaborate with certain organizations who work with children at the poverty line. And then we offer nominated students uh, from those 
organizations to receive a full scholarship at the National Children's Chorus, including all uh, travel and materials paid for as well. So it's, uh, it's completely uh, funded, the experience, and we're really excited to be expanding the program. We recently collaborated with the LA Unified School District, and we have a few students in Los Angeles who are per performing with the National Children's Chorus as part of this initiative. We're now looking to expand this nationally in all eight of our cities. Oh, wow. That gave me goosebumps. How exciting. And have you gotten some really good talent out of that, that you're just grateful that this is available now? Yes. Well, some of the students, I mean, it's only been around for about six or eight months. So uh, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure over time, like, you know, it takes a while to grow and to develop talent to the point where you can say, oh, yes, we had a graduate from this program who's now at Juilliard or who now is uh, getting their master's degree in singing. So I'm sure we'll have those stories to tell in a few years. Where's your favorite place to perform with everybody? Oh, that's that's a really good question. I really love performing at uh, Frank Gehry's Walt Disney Concert Hall in Los Angeles. It's just such a beautiful building architecturally. I have images of it on my wall here. <laughs> and uh, it's it, it's a place where you feel that something special is about to happen even before it happens. And so it's just so extremely stunning. And I, lo I love performing music there. The acoustics are spectacular as well. Carnegie Hall, you know, can't go wrong with that. That's always a treat to get to perform there. We perform in so many great places, so it's hard to choose, but those are some of the great ones. Yeah, and do the kids probably like the Disney World one the best just because it's Disney? Or do they know the significance of some of the other ones and are like, I got to play here? They love it all because uh, we, te we, we teach them about the significance of any venue that they're performing. And so, yes, they do love Walt Disney Concert Hall, but they equally love Carnegie Hall, Lincoln Center, and uh, many of the other great venues. So how many years do you hope to stay with the National Children's Chorus? 20 years? You're coming up with 20 years? That's a big deal. <laughs> I think that my uh, work and this journey is very mission driven. So uh, I feel that uh, as long as I feel I have something uh, important and significant to give and to offer, uh, that's that's my reason for doing the work that I do. And so I think that will continue moving forward. Mm -hmm. And what's your favorite thing about it? Is that moment where you see that all of the hard work that you've put into this program actually makes a difference in a child's life when they actually share that with you or you can actually see it in real time. That's the most rewarding thing of all. And so I think from the outside, people see all of the external signs of success from the Grammy Award to you know all of the places that we perform around the world. But what you don't see from the outside are those moments inside the chorus where students are actually experiencing a very significant enrichment of their lives and their lives are being uh, nourished in such powerful ways. And we get to see that inside the organization. I would have to say that is the most rewarding thing of all. I would imagine. I mean, I can't, I think about them being on stage and singing and that confidence that they get to carry into no matter what they do in the future. Absolutely. That's exactly it. Yeah, I have a son that is 11 right now. And when he was nine, he told me he wanted to be a DJ. So I got him DJ lessons up here and he's taking singing lessons up here and he's writing his own music and he has it on Spotify or something right now, right? That his instructor helped him and he's made maybe a dollar of songs being played. But he's like, I mean, I tell you what, it is like he made a million dollars, the excitement that he has and just, he can't wait to go back to his class again and da, 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 da. And it's, that spills into everything he does. And so I have to imagine that the kids that you're working with, they come home and they feel that empowerment into everything else they do. Yeah, and that's the most important thing to realize about music is that it really nourishes every aspect of your life from your relationships with people to the way that you see yourself to the way that you decide you're going to conduct yourself in this world. So it, it's it, this experience is so much more than learning how to sing well. Music in, the, uh, in these experiences is really the vehicle uh, for something much larger. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Okay, so how do people reach out? How do we follow along and see what these students are up to. And if we live in these areas, apply and try out. 
it's very simple to audition for the chorus. You just go to the homepage of our website at www.nationalchildrenschorus.com and right on the homepage, there's a red button uh, for students to apply and there's all information on the program listed there. To follow us, our Instagram account, National Children's Chorus is uh, continually populated with such stunning imagery and videos. Uh, we just uh, were working on the holiday album that's going to be released later this season in a, a, cl a collaboration with the London Symphony Orchestra uh, that's also playing on the album. And so the students are really excited and they did such an amazing job this summer recording the vocals. And uh, it's going to be an amazing moment when that comes out. So that'll be shared on uh, Instagram as well when it drops, as well as uh, streaming available on Spotify and Apple Music. All right. I love this. I love this. Is there anything else you would like to share with our audience before we wrap up for the day? I think we, we covered all the most important things. I think that that again, I, I think that for, for parents, understanding that music is not just for musicians and people who are going to go into music, it really is such an important and amazing presence in a child's life that really improves their ability to cope with everything else in it. And so uh, it, it's, it's just a wonderful thing to be a part of. And so I think getting that message out is really powerful because I think so many children stand to have music be a positive presence in their lives and um, in what they're doing. No, I wholeheartedly agree. Luke, thanks so much for your time and teaching us all about this National Children's Chorus. And thank you for serving them for 20 years. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Jen. I really appreciate it.